Good day, everybody. Hope you're well. Today, uh, we're going to try to look at um, the beginning of uh, an introduction to St. Luke's Gospel, which, of course, includes the Acts of the Apostles, because everybody agrees that uh, Luke wrote a two-volume work, the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. And it's pivotal, Luke's work, in understanding the history of the early church and also in the development of, of Christian theology. So we're going to look at, first off, what's special about Luke's writings. Why is he so significant? Then, secondly, we'll look at Luke himself, a little bit on that. Third, we're going to take a look at the writings of the New Testament, how and when did we come to have writings that we said are, are the New Testament, are Scripture? Because it's not a, an inevitable sort of thing that happened. And then, finally, we look at the Gospel of Luke itself, the structure and the sources. Okay, the first of these sections then is, what's special about Luke? What does he really contribute to our study and understanding of Jesus. The ancient 2nd century manuscripts begin to attribute this particular Gospel and Acts to Luke. And the fathers of the church identify this Luke as the companion of Paul. There are, in the Acts of the Apostles, whole sections where the writer, the author, starts talking about we. We did that. We did this and so on. And they seem to support the idea that he's an eyewitness to the events that happened, many of them, in the Acts of the Apostles, this Luke. Luke also claims to be writing in both the Gospel and the Acts an orderly account, an historical account of the life of Jesus and the beginnings of the church. And he writes them in such a way, he says, that uh, the life of Jesus forms the backdrop to volume two. And he recapitulates all that as he starts an orderly account of the birth of the church. Now there's a big controversy about Luke, which is... Uh, been there for 50 years or more amongst the theologians and scripture scholars. Those who tend to be more Germanic uh, tend to see Luke as primarily a theologian and that he's really trying to impose his ideas and his theology on the events shaping the life of Jesus and of the early church. They say that his version, especially of the early church and its development, is just so different from Paul's account. And just to give you two examples there where there's a difference. The first example is about when and what happens at the first ever big church council in 49 AD. So we'll look at that. Uh, we, won't, we, we won't look at that now, but that's to be held in mind, kept in mind. And another one is the story of the conversion of Paul. They differ, Paul himself, with St. Luke's account. However, we, sh we should keep in mind this. In the Anglo-Saxon world, which has, in a way, a greater sense of history, there is a, a fellow called Colin Hamer, Colin Hamer, and his book, The Book of Acts and the Setting of Hellenistic History, which came out just over 20, about 25 years ago, argues strongly that so much in Luke Acts is historical. And I know Michael Fallon would certainly subscribe to that theory, as would many Anglo-Saxons. This is not to deny, of course, 
that Luke does have a strong concept of theology. Um, he sees in Jesus and in the lives of the apostles Peter and Paul the impact of the Holy Spirit. He's got a strong Holy Spirit theology in both Gospel and Acts. Secondly, we can see in uh, the life of Jesus things that are mirrored in the life of the apostles. For example, just one, Jesus' death. As he dies in St. Luke's Gospel, he says, Jesus, in your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. And so we go to Acts, and we see that great proto-martyr, first martyr, Stephen, when he comes to die at the hands of the Jewish people, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The same beautiful surrender to God. There is a sense too of salvation history in the way that the gospel is written and in the way the acts of the apostles are written. There is a plan that God has for the salvation of the world beginning in Jerusalem and in, in, uh, in the life of Jesus and then spreading out from there. And the other, another example of uh, Luke's theology is that whatever happens in the Gospel and what happens in the Acts of the Apostles are always seen as fulfilments of what's been spoken of in the scriptures. It fulfills the hopes and dreams of God's people. So in some ways we could say he is an apologetic theologian. So he's wanting to show that the gospel and the what the apostles do and say fulfills everything that's been said in the Old Testament. We all love St. Luke. He's got some passages and stories which are unique to him. And certainly he's able to paint a beautiful picture of Jesus. Someone that's lovable and merciful. Someone that we can all relate to. A human Jesus. Think of the Good Samaritan. Think of the story of the ten lepers, or the one we love of the prodigal son. Think of, in the Acts of the Apostles, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Think of the story of Paul's shipwreck. They're magnificent passages and stories that touch us. We'd also think, too, how brilliant he is, Luke, in the way he constructs speeches. And there are a lot of speeches in the Acts of the Apostles. Interestingly, in the Gospel, we have the story going towards Jerusalem. And in, that's in the Gospel. In the Acts of the Apostles, it's going away from Jerusalem to Rome. But that's a little bit on the uniqueness of this gospel and, and there's two volumes on gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. A little bit more now on who is Luke. A little thanks to Father Michael Fallon here. Early tradition, second century, attributes this gospel to an otherwise relatively unknown figure called Luke, who is described as a Syrian physician and a companion of Paul. He probably wrote his two-volume work in the 80s of the first century, and it's predominantly for non-Jewish, that is, for Gentile readers. In the opening passage, Theophilus is mentioned, to whom Luke addresses his work, that may be a Gentile person 
However, the phrase means lover of God, Theophilus. And so, uh, it could be anybody who loves God. The oldest manuscript we have comes from uh, around the year 200, and it states clearly then that it is the gospel according to Luke. So by that time, in everybody's mind, it was Luke the author. And in the, um, in the muratorial canon, muratorian canon, around the 180, this is what is said. Luke was a physician after the ascension of Christ when Paul had taken him along with him as one devoted to letters, he wrote it all under his own name from hearsay. For he himself had not seen the Lord in person, but insofar as he was able to follow it all, he thus began his account with the birth of John. And here's Tertullian, who writes just after the year 200. Luke was not an apostle, but only a man of apostolic times. Not a master, but a disciple. The apostle he followed was undoubtedly Paul. Tertullian also calls Luke as inspired by Paul. And Luke's gospel, the gospel of his teacher Paul. He spoke of it also as a a digest of Paul's gospel. Some support for this can be found in references to Luke in letters attributed to Paul. In Philemon, verse 24, in Colossians, chapter 4, verse 14, and in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. And now a little bit about something that I think is important for us all to understand as best as we can, how we came to call the books that we now know as the New Testament, how we came to call them divinely inspired scripture. It did take a long time before the church recognised the writings of Christians as holy scripture. And the reason is partly because they believe that the scriptures were what we now call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. And partly because in the first century especially, they prioritised the spirit-filled preachers and teachers over books. So there wasn't really a need in the first few generations to consider those Christian letters or Gospels as scripture. Clement of Rome, Bishop of Rome, around the year 96, 96, a marvellous spiritual writer, says this, this is the bishop, he says this, let us do whatever is written, especially remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, which he spoke, when he was teaching gentleness and patience. Be merciful so that you may obtain mercy. Forgive so that you may be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. As you judge, so you will be judged. And as he's writing, of course, we can hear echoes of the Sermon on the Mount, but not exactly quoted. Again, another passage, in another passage he writes, Take up the epistle of blessed Paul, the apostle. What did he first write you at the beginning of the gospel? With true spiritual insight he wrote about himself and about Cephas and Apollos. So we don't really have exact quotes yet, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't yet have that status of Scripture where we quote it, but there are more allusions to it and allusions to the preachers 
rather than to the uh, epistles, the exact uh, literal epistle or gospel. Now the Didache, it's a lovely book, the teachings, it is a wonderful book. And that's the latter part of the first century, the same time as Clement of Rome. He, the, the author there obviously uses Matthew and has a knowledge of Luke and John. The lovely Ignatius of Antioch. Now we've got a number of his letters and they are early second century, the first decade. He uses... In his, uh, in his letters, the first letter to the Corinthians, he uses Ephesians, John and Matthew. But in nowhere does he say, this is scripture. So we're just quoting, he's just quoting inspired writings. Justin, one of my favourites, from the middle of the second century, speaks of the Memoirs of the Apostles. I love that expression. They're obviously the Gospels and they're read in liturgy. Paul and the words of Jesus are often cited by him. Around the same time as Justin, in the middle of the second century, there's a fellow called Marcion. He's actually a heretic. And in reaction to him and his teachings, the church develops the canon of Scripture. It actually begins to say, these books and these books alone contain for us what we think is Scripture. Marcion had a single gospel and a collection of Paul's letters. A single gospel, a conflation of the gospels, and that was that. He didn't like the Old Testament. There were attempts to create new gospels on the one hand and also to create a conflated gospel, a single gospel, as Martin had done, by putting all the gospels into one story on the other. Now, some of the new Gospels that emerge in the second century are the Gospel of Peter, a very fascinating, very fascinating Gospel. The Gospel to the Egyptians and the Gospel of Thomas. And Thomas has uh, something special about it. Um, it's often quoted when it quotes the other Gospels, because it's, it's very close to a lot of the sayings in the Synoptic Gospels. The restriction to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John as being the Gospels is a result of a gradual development which sought to counter both tendencies. The tendency to create new Gospels and the tendency to merge them all into one, particularly insofar as they came to us and came to the people of their day in the form of heresy, of Marcion. It's during this, the later part of the second century that there developed the practice of citing the gospel according to Matthew, or the Gospel according to Luke. A system of naming the Gospels and the fact that they really are one Gospel, one good news, but written according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John. The first time we ever mention the words Old Testament occur to us from a beautiful bishop, Melito of Sardis, in 180 AD. They were just called the scriptures before that. But now we have a sense of an older scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and newer, the Christian scriptures. 
So the very first time we say Old Testament comes to us in 180 AD. And the first mention of New Testament is 192 AD. Now this, I've already quoted the Muratorian fragment from 180 AD. I'll just tell you a tiny bit about that. It's a rough 7th century Latin translation of a Greek list of New Testament books. But it was only discovered in the Ambrosian Library in Milan in the 18th century by a father Ludovico Muratori, hence Muratorian fragments. It has a list of 24 books. There's the Hebrews, got the letter to the Hebrews isn't there, nor is James, 1st and 2nd Peter, or 3rd John. But it has two other books which never became part. The book of the Wisdom of Solomon and the Apocalypse of Peter. In the 4th century, there's substantial agreement across all the churches on the books that constitute the New Testament or the Christian scriptures. The book, the letter to the Hebrews, is only accepted in the Western churches in the 5th century and, and the last book to be accepted in the Eastern churches is the book of Revelations. Now, the two great Bibles which we have from the first century, books, codexes, are the Codex Sinaiticus, discovered in Mount Sinai, includes also in the books of the New Testament the Epistle to Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Now the Codex Alexandrinus from Alexandria includes St. Clement of Rome's first and second letters. So just a tiny bit now to conclude on the sources of St. Luke and the structure of his Gospel. We should say that Luke uses St. Mark's Gospel as Matthew does. But Luke also, with Matthew, have a common source for a lot of their material. And we call that Q, quella, source, Q. And then Luke has a lot of material that's his own. We call that L, L for Luke. So, just briefly, the first three chapters pretty well, the first two chapters pretty well, are Luke. Then we follow Mark, from chapter 3 into chapter 6, with a bit of Q material as well as Mark. And then we have um, Luke chapter 6 verse 20 to 8 verse 3, where um, Luke interrupts Mark's story. They call it the first or the small interpolation. And it's Q material and Luke's own. Then we go back to Mark for chapters 8 and 9. And then from the end of chapter 9 until chapter 18, back to Q and material that's peculiar to Luke. And then 18 to 24, the beginning of 24, we have Back to Mark again, following Mark's basic story with some of his own material and the last big story uh, stories of the resurrection are, are, are Luke's own. So it's a mixture. The structure, well just very briefly, we have a prologue which as Luke speaks about himself as writing an orderly account and an historical account. Then we have the infancy narrative, chapters 1 and 2. 
Then we move to the preparation for the ministry of Jesus in Galilee, chapters 3 and the first part of 4. Then we have the wonderful ministry of Jesus in Galilee, chapter 4, verse 14, to near the end of chapter 9. Then we have that uh, particularly Luke and Q material of the journey to Jerusalem. The end of chapter 9, well into chapter 19, a huge part of the gospel. And then the ministry in Jerusalem. And then finally, the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus, chapter 22 to 24. I'd just like to conclude our introductory lecture by a word about the prologue. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke writes a personal prologue to his work, conscious of the historical dimension of what he's trying to do and of how he has marshaled into a coherent narrative eyewitnesses' accounts and pre-existing sources. The prologue also suggests that it's aimed not just for believers, but to all people of goodwill. We remind ourselves of the name Theophilus, and this is uh, the person to whom the book is addressed, means a lover of God. And of course, all of us are lovers of God. And although Luke may be writing to a particular person who has that name, it's more likely he's writing to all of us. Johnson, Luke Johnson comments, Luke has brought the peculiar sensitivity of apologetic literature to see ourselves as others see us, to the story of Jesus and to the story of the early church. Luke seems to be saying that previous accounts and we perhaps can think of Mark, are somewhat unsatisfactory in certain areas. And perhaps he is referring to the success of the gentle mission of Paul and the failure, ultimately, of the mission to Jesus. And he wants to show how the church of the Gentiles actually is a faithful continuation of the story of God's call to the Jewish people. So as we read those opening four verses, we have a sense of what he's trying to do. And of course, next, uh, next lecture, we actually move into chapter one. Thanks, everybody.